Canadian timber. 70% of Canada's saw timber comes from the Pacific province of British Columbia. As Canada's third largest province, it includes not only the mainland, but a number of islands in the Pacific Ocean. The largest are Vancouver Island and the group of Queen Charlotte Islands. They contain some of the best timberland in Canada. Separating the islands from the mainland is the Inside Passage, a water transportation route and a rich fishing area. The passage offers sheltered feeding grounds for salmon, halibut, and herring. The value of British Columbia's fish production is about one-third of Canada's total. Along the inside passage, Tall coast mountains make up much of the mainland coast. The coast mountains, part of the western Cordillera mountain system of North America, make up the westernmost edge of the Yukon Territory. The Yukon and British Columbia share two other geographic landforms, one of which is the Canadian Rocky Mountain system, a major portion of the western Cordillera. Between the two mountain systems are the interior plateau of British Columbia and the Yukon Plateau. Most of the Yukon is far north and high in altitude. The Yukon River and its tributaries cut through the sparsely populated territory, which is controlled by Canada's central government. The three other territorial districts, Mackenzie, Kewaitan and Franklin are often called the Northwest Territories. Each of them has different northern landscapes. Part of the Mackenzie District lies in the interior plains of North America. In this region of rivers and lakes, power stations haven't as yet harnessed much of the potential water power. East of the interior plains is the Canadian Shield, making up much of Mackenzie and all of the Kiwaitan district. The Shield's rugged and rocky, dotted by lakes and rivers. Most of Kiwaitan is tundra, with low vegetation during the short summer. The rest of the year it's barren and frozen solid. Here, a few Canadian Eskimos live and hunt caribou, polar bear, walrus, seal. Eskimos make their living from hunting, trapping, fishing, and handicrafts. They've changed to modern ways, making native handicrafts to sell. And they live in modern homes rather than igloos. The Kiwaitan district has large, unexplored regions with untapped mineral deposits. Like Kiwaitan, the Arctic islands of the Franklin district are tundra land. The islands make up the Arctic archipelago. Trees won't grow here because of the cold Arctic climate. But during the summer, flowers bloom where the topsoil thaws. Very few people live on the Arctic islands. The history of Western Canada goes back to explorers like James Cook, who landed on the coast of Vancouver Island. Meeting friendly Indians, he opened the way for the Pacific fur trade. Meanwhile, adventurous explorers and traders pushed inland from Eastern Canada. Alexander Mackenzie journeyed from the Great Lakes across the Rockies to the Pacific, discovering the river that was named after him. Others pushed farther north, where animals grew heavier fur for protection from the extreme winters. 
Hudson's Bay Company opened a chain of trading posts under an exclusive charter from the British government. Fur trading was the major industry of the West until the 1860s. Farmers from the United States, Europe, and Eastern Canada moved into the valley of the Fraser River in southern British Columbia. Today, this valley is an important agricultural region with many small dairy farms. In the lower Fraser Valley, dairy farms are on a lowland that needs dikes to protect it from spring flooding. Farther east, in the Okanagan Valley, irrigated orchards of apples, cherries, and pears grow well. Even though the coast mountains cut off moisture carried by winds from the Pacific Ocean, the plateau is not too dry for grazing cattle. Ranching began in the 1860s when cattlemen drove herds in from Oregon. The 1858 gold rush was another boon to settlement of British Columbia. Gold was discovered in the Fraser River. Thousands of fortune hunters came into British Columbia. When the gold gave out, many miners stayed, becoming merchants, farmers, and loggers. Forty years after the rush to the Fraser River, prospectors found gold in the Klondike River Basin of the Yukon. 100,000 rugged miners rushed to the cold, barren Yukon, where they built towns like Dawson, Johnson Crossing, Keno Hill. They named their mining camps Bonanza, El Dorado, Gold Bottom. Within four years, $22 million of gold had been hand mined or mechanically dredged from the Yukon. Today, gold production has decreased considerably. The once familiar Yukon River steamers which brought people and supplies have been replaced by other transportation systems, like the Alaska Highway. The highway runs from Dawson Creek, British Columbia, through the Yukon into Alaska. Even though gold production has decreased, most of the people of the Yukon still work in the mining industry. Modern mining centers around copper, asbestos, lead, zinc, and silver. Many of the Yukon's miners live in Whitehorse. Whitehorse grew because of its rich copper mines and because it's a railroad terminus. In the Yukon, the northern climate allows only a short growing season of limited crops. Planes and trucks bring in most of the goods people need. Like the Yukon, the Northwest Territories are rich in mineral wealth. Petroleum, lead, zinc, and gold are the important minerals. Although the territories have great underground wealth, their distance from population centers has prevented much mining. The largest settlement is Yellowknife, the capital of the Northwest Territories. It's also a center for gold dredging and mining. Near the Arctic Circle, Yellowknife has 16 to 20 hours of daylight in July and August. In contrast to the isolation of Yellowknife is Victoria, the capital of British Columbia. The city's at the southern tip of Vancouver Island, and it's often called Canada's most English city. Victoria has mild winters and cool summers, 
and flowers bloom during most of the year. Across from Victoria on the mainland is Vancouver. It's Canada's third largest city and the nation's gateway to the Pacific and the Orient. The city's ice-free harbors are its chief asset. Vancouver's heavily industrialized. Most of the manufacturing industries process raw materials from nearby. Manufacturing wood products such as plywood, veneer, pulp, and paper. Refining and processing oil and other minerals. Packaging and exporting fish. The port of Vancouver and its heavy industries will undoubtedly expand with British Columbia. As Canada continues to grow, the new settlements in the Northwest Territories will grow into cities. While today, they're largely undeveloped and almost unpopulated, they're beginning to build a new era in their history.